I believe we can all have a positive effect on those around us. I know the opposite is true, but let's focus on the positives. I also believe that where we start our journey doesn't have to determine how we live our lives. As young children, most of us learn the rights and wrongs and the do's and don'ts from our parents. It's what Andy Robbins calls our blueprint. As we get older, we'll be influenced by other people, friends, family, school teachers, and all those little things that happen throughout our lives. Like a lot of children, I weren't the most confident. At school, I was a child looking out of the window, wishing I was outside playing. I had lots of far-fetched dreams. I don't really do Greek mythology, but I remember the story about Icarus. Icarus and his dad, Daed Daedalus, were both in prison in Crete. Daedalus, being a master craftsman, made some wings out of feathers so that Icarus and he could escape from the prison. As they were about to fly from Crete, Daedalus told his son not to fly too close to the water, otherwise the water would get into the wings and he wouldn't be able to fly, and not to fly too close to the sun, otherwise the wax would melt and he would fall to the sea. But Icarus did not listen to his father's advice and he flew too high and the wax melted and he fell to the sea and he drowned. So I looked down from my classroom window where I was wishing I was someone else thinking, I'm going to try that, but no way am I going to use wax. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, my school report said I was a daydreamer. Maybe, maybe this was true, but there's a lot of stuff going on in my life that they didn't know about. Even as a kid, I wanted the world to be a better place. I wanted to help people, and I thought it might be possible to help the, the closest to me, but obviously didn't expect to be able to change the world. From the age of seven, myself and my two sisters were brought up by my father on a council estate in Coventry after the divorce of our parents. My dad was a former professional boxer, and it seemed that everybody we met knew and respected him, and I wanted to be just like him. I wanted to be a boxer, clearly, but everything that else he had. We were, we were all known, I, me and my sisters, as Max's, Big Max's kids, and we were proud to be so. I first went to a boxing club when I was age 10, what helped me decide wasn't my dad, but the day that I was playing football, and the lad wouldn't give me my ball back. I remember telling him that I'd better give him my ball back, or else. Or else what? Wasn't the response I wanted or expected. And this is where I discovered my other talent for running. <laughs> As he chased me out of the park without a hope of catching me. The next day, I joined a running club. No, I didn't. I got boxing lessons at the Bell Green Club. And I loved it. After a short time, I got to love the smell of the room, the sounds of the whistling, skipping ropes. Even the walk to the club was exciting. And of course, I was following in the footsteps of my dad. All was going great until one day I was asked to get in the boxing ring with an 11 year old. I was only 10. Your turn, Dave, sounded very much like that day in the park when that boy said, or else what? And I declined the invitation. And it was the last time I attended the Bell Green Boxing Club. I hung up my gloves at 10 years old. I did start boxing again when I was 14 at the Standard Triumph Amateur Boxing Club. This was after I started a paper round at, at Ward's News Agents on the Radford Road in Coventry, and I met a lad called Andy Christie. Andy Christie was one of five boxing brothers who all went on to be national champions, so I knew that I was in safe hands. When I got to the club, fortunately, all those feelings I had when I went to the Bell Green Boxing Club came flip flooding back. A boxing club is like many clubs, I guess. It becomes like your extended family. You all look after each other. And when things aren't working so well for you at home, the boxing club becomes like your safe haven. The coaches in the boxing club become like second parents, and the more senior boxers become like big brothers. And, and they all will set, are happy to share their stories and their experiences with you. Being the first boxing club that I um, competed for, and the first club that my dad saw me box at, then the Standard Triumph had a special place in my heart. And I feel like I have to mention Tom McGarry. He ran the club. He was a larger than life Scotsman from Lanarkshire, uh, and who I could barely understand a word he said. He passed away at the age of 83, and I know this because I was one of the pallbearers at his funeral. So it's a sad time, but I felt honoured to carry him, because he had carried us for so long and affected so many lives in a positive way. I finished my days of boxing here in Banbury, where I boxed for the Willie Freud Amateur Boxing Club, under a coach called Ken Reynolds, a great coach called Ken Reynolds. 
who in six years helped me to secure five home counties titles. I've, I stopped boxing after 12 years of competing when I failed a medical for, for a bad neck. So it was the doctor who was seeing me at the time. So I started full contact kickboxing and I competed for around four years. I just thought, why not start a sport where people not only try to kick, punch you in the face, but also trying to kick you in the face? Anyway, that seemed to sort my neck out. <laughs> after, after 16 years of combat sports, I guess the perfect job for me would be to run a boxing club. In 2003, I opened my own fitness club. I'd previously be te been teaching fitness classes in community halls, schools, schools and sports centres around the town, but I wanted a place of my own, so at the end of the night, I could lock it up and say, yeah, that's mine. I first opened Spitting Sorders in 2003, just as a fitness club, and after a couple of years, started a boxing club with my former coach, Ken Reynolds. And we started producing boxers right from the off, and our first national champion we had in 2007. But mu much, much more than that, we started getting children's lives back on track. We were giving children all the benefits that I had when I first joined a boxing club. And we were tackling all those conditions we hear about in the news and read about on social media, like ADHD and Asperger's, bullying, depression, anxiety and self-harming. And many of the other social issues that I dealt with were like racism and a sense of not belonging. I remembered as a child being called a nignog and a gollywog and being told to go black home where I came from. Because I was mixed race, I also got called a coconut and a redskin by people whose both parents were black. So I was kind of stuck in that uncomfortable middle. I understand life can be tough sometimes. I get that, and it will be for all of us. Most people, in fact, I would say, confidently say, everybody in this room will have suffered loss that has affected their mental well-being. Whether it's your first romantic relationship ending, that was tough for me, but thinking back, not so tough for her. I think she was, I think she was quite relieved. She said she felt free again. <laughs> Moving house away from your friends can seem tough when you're young. Some of us will lose pets, jobs, and marriages may break down, and all the complications that go with that, especially if you have children. And of course, as we get older, we have to deal with the loss of the older members of our family. So when someone tells you that mental health issues affect one in four, one in three, or even one in two, they're being misinformed. We will all have issues, and we'll need support along the way. That's why it's important to surround ourselves with good people. What I believe is life becomes easier when we have a purpose, when we realize we have value. I also be believe the opposite is true. So if we don't have a purpose and we don't feel we have a value, then it can lead us to places, life can be difficult, and it can lead us to darker places, which often includes anxiety and depression. Many of the young children who use my gym are bought there, not because they want to be boxers, but because their parents are worried about them. Some children seem to have lost the ability to communicate without a mobile phone and are spending all their times in their bedrooms instead of going out to play like we did in the olden days. We have parks and every house and estate in our town and they are normally empty. Children aren't playing out like they used to, so parents get their children involved in other activities, like my gym. The majority of people who come to my gym are very nervous, and why wouldn't they be? The place is full of children. So we try to make them comfortable by letting them know that it's okay. They don't have to worry. And it's okay to make mistakes, because we all do. Sometimes a parent will bring a, a child before a class. Instead of enrolling them into a class, they'll bring to me the day before. And so just to meet me. And when they do this, I will teach them some basic boxing skills. So I'll get them how to, tell them how to stand and how to punch. And when they do come to a class, then I'll get them to demonstrate with another, to help show another child who hasn't learned them yet. We have a little eight-year-old, formerly really shy girl, who is now happily demonstrates her skills to the whole class, including the adults. Her mum says that her confidence has carried through to her school, and the school has become more fun. Now the gym has become her place to shine, and I like to believe that we have become her extended family and the extended family of most of our members. And I also think it has become a safe haven for some too, just like it was for me. One story I'd like to share with you is about a 22-year-old 20, lad who recently came back to the gym. When he was 15, he came to me for work experience. While he was up with me, I took him to a class where I taught fitness at a rehabilitation center, and also to a, a school for physically and mentally handicapped children. Some of us might know it's Frank Wise. 
He told me that because of these experiences, he wanted to help people less fortunate than himself. And when he was 17, he went to work in an orphanage in South Africa. We can often make a difference to people's lives without realizing. This is also true of another man who changed the way I viewed mental health. This, was, this man came to my gym about 10 years ago and asked me if I'd be the main beneficiary to his will. And obviously I was surprised and a bit confused. I knew he worked in the bar next to the gym, but we weren't close friends. I didn't even like him. <laughs> Just kidding. He was, and hopefully still is, a lovely man. But he explained to me that two years previously, he came over to my gym and he wanted to end his life. He told me I invited him in and made him a cup of coffee. And I talked him out of killing himself. He explained that he had a health condition that could strike him down at any time and had no close family or friends and I was the first person he thought of. A weird situation, but something you don't forget. Something that makes you think that maybe a conversation and a cup of tea could save a life. What a concept. Having a father who boxed has massively influ influenced my life, but he struggled with gambling, and my mother with alcohol, and I love them more than I can tell you. Both my parents died early, my mother in her early 40s, and my father in his early 60s both to what I believe were uh, bad lifestyle choices. Romanticists might say that they live too far, they live fast and die young, but I don't. I have three sons. My mother died, take a breath. Back in the room. My mother died and before any of them were born and my father never got to see them grow up. My children have no memory of my mother and take a breath. Little memory of my father, who had such a massive influence on my life, need to get past his paragraph. And sometimes, clearly, I struggle with that. Right, the man who introduced me to helping people struggling with addiction and therefore added another twist to my journey was Jamie. Jamie worked in an organisation that helps people in recovery from drinking drugs in Oxford. He explained to me that in his home city of Manchester, boxing was being used um, to help people in addiction, and wondered if I'd be interested in doing the same thing in Banbury and Oxford. Um, with drink and drugs having such an effect on a portion of my own family, and then of course I, I, I agreed, and I took a course and became a peer mentor at the local drug and alcohol treatment centre, and I volunteered once a week at reception. Here I saw many faces from my younger past, but their faces were a shadow of the people I knew. Women, just like my mother, were no longer with their young children. Their children were now living with extended family or in foster care or worse. Some had carried the habits of their, of their, their, their parents and become addicts, addicts themselves. Mental health problems by this time were all over the news. According to the Samaritans, this is a bit sad, this bit. According to the Samaritans, almost 6,000 people take their own lives each year. That's 16 a day. And I worked out with my basic, basic mathematical knowledge that is one every waking hour. We, the TED Talk organizers and the speakers, met here this morning at St. Mary's Church at 10 a.m., that's seven hours ago. So it's likely that another seven people will have taken their own lives in the UK while we've been here. Just a month ago, I spoke to a well-respected man who took up a conversation with me in a coffee shop. He asked me about the group I run for people who suffer with mental health and told me of his troubles with anxiety. He then asked me, his friend, if he wanted to share his story. His friend proceeded to tell me how he got as far as preparing a rope to take his own life. The thing that stopped him was um, how it affected his family. I started running classes for people dealing with anxiety and depression with cognitive, cognitive easy for me to say, behavioural therapy coach Bob Scott in 2017, largely as a result of my own life's experiences many of which I spoke about today, and I'll continue to run those classes now. As our earlier speaker, Karen, says, we, are, we humans are tribal. We are dependent on each other, and we all have the power to help each other. Much of anxiety and depression is caused by loneliness. Whilst on holiday with my wife, we met and spoke to an American lady. As much as I disagreed on tipping 20%, regardless of the service we may have received at a restaurant, I did have to agree that since society has been more connected through mobile phones, we have become less connected as a community. Becoming more connected has led us to being less connected. She said it twice, 
and it stayed with me. So I'm saying it twice, so hopefully it'll stay with you. I've shared a few experiences of my journey with you today, and in summary, I believe, like our early speak speaker Callan said, we need to rediscover our tribe, and that we need to be there for each other. We should reconnect more with phone calls and meet up and do actual activities. Spend time together, go walking, talk more, and spend a bit less time collecting likes and sending messages and playing virtual games. We could choose to help people, maybe not to the extreme that Ewan did when he went to South Africa, but we may discover that by helping people, we, it can make ourselves feel better about ourselves. We might understand that people struggling with addiction are not people, are bad people, and addiction is not only limited to drugs and alcohol, but is a habit, just like gambling, shopping, tanning booths, social media, all of which can have a detrimental effect on our lives and the lives of our friends and families. We all can benefit from mentors, whether it be a sports coach or a counsellor. And finally, using superglue to stick your feathers together instead of wax wouldn't have helped me escape from my lessons any more than it would have helped Icarus and his dad escape from Crete. But I do believe we have the ability to have a positive effect on those around us. Where we start our journey doesn't have to de determine how we live our lives. And collectively, by being nicer to each other, we can change the world. Thank you.